issues. First of all, please select your preferred language from the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. There are two languages available. English, which will be the language in which I'm delivering the webinar, and French, which will be delivered through an interpreter. So please choose your preferred language uh, uh, channel in order that you'll be able to follow the webinar properly. Uh, secondly, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones muted uh, unless you feel you need to speak or ask a question or make a point. As for your cameras, you're welcome to have them on or off as you prefer. If you do wish to ask a question or make an intervention, you can do so in one of three ways. You can either switch on your microphone and speak directly. You can use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen to select raise hand, and I will see a raised hand next to the participant who wishes to speak. Or you can type your message into the chat, which I am monitoring as well, and that will allow you to um, intervene either directly through the chat or at least draw attention and I will then pass the floor to you so you'll be able to make your intervention. For those of you who perhaps are not familiar with this series of webinars, Tuesday Second Chance, as its name suggests, always takes place on a Tuesday. And it consists of a series of webinars where we look at case studies, real case studies, which happened in the maritime security domain throughout history. And we see what implications those case studies have for our challenges, our efforts, our operational procedures in today's world. It's always, as I say, cheaper to learn from other people's difficulties and mistakes rather than having to make them all over again. So it's a series of webinars in which we're looking at these events and understanding their implications on what we do today. The most important aspect of Tuesday Second Chance is the participation from your side. Uh, I will be giving a presentation to start off. It will be maybe 20, 25 minutes long, but it is your interventions that really add value to this process. Hearing about your experiences understanding what your concerns are and looking at what needs to be done in your individual countries, agencies, organizations to improve global management of maritime security, because this is very much a cooperative venture. Today, we are going to speak about the concept of hot pursuit, uh, and I'll begin by sharing my screen. If you would give me just a moment. Isabel, can you confirm that the shared screen is visible? Yes, Andrew, it's perfect. Thank you very much. So, as I said, today we're going to be speaking about the concept of hot pursuit. And this is a somewhat misunderstood uh, concept or jurisdictional basis because it's actually a way of a coastal state exercising its jurisdiction but potentially a very powerful tool for coastal states to ensure that they can protect and defend their interests, both in the waters close to their coastline, as well as further away from their coastline. And to look at hot pursuit, we're going to look at two case studies in this case, both of which involved uh, IUU fishing, so illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing in the Southern Ocean, so in the oceans south of the Indian Ocean and Pacific towards the um, Antarctic region. These cases involved two fishing vessels known as the South Tommy and the Vyarsa One, and they occurred within a few years of each other, but both of them involved authorities from Australia in their attempt to enforce their fisheries regulations. Our objectives for today are to examine these two particular incidents and look at the level of operational effort which was necessary to conduct these pursuits, 
We're then going to analyze the cases, both from the operational perspective, the legal perspective, and perhaps most important, the perspective of international cooperation. Hot pursuit is something where the need to cooperate with other international partners is probably going to be at the highest level. And finally, we will discuss the overall concept of hot pursuit and perhaps examine how well prepared we are to exercise this jurisdiction uh, as coastal states and what needs to be done to make sure that this right can be exercised in an efficient manner. Let's begin by introducing hot pursuit. Hot pursuit is found within the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, which is the major legal text for maritime operations. And you can find this in Article 111, 111. Basically, hot pursuit is a basis on which coastal states can continue to pursue a suspect vessel even when that suspect vessel has left their normal zones of jurisdiction. Now, the normal zones of jurisdiction of the coastal states are the territorial seas, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, and potentially the continental shelf. Outside this, on the high seas, usually the coastal state does not have any further jurisdiction. What hot pursuit provides for is to allow a suspect vessel which has committed a crime inside the jurisdiction of the coastal state to be pursued onto the high seas despite it having left their jurisdictional zone. So it's basically the suspect vessel drags and takes the jurisdiction of the coastal state with it but it is a right which is subject to some very, very specific conditions. The most important of these are, first of all, the offence had to take place in a zone where the coastal state had jurisdiction. So if it was, for instance, a fisheries offence, that offence had to be observed taking place within the exclusive economic zone or the fisheries zone of the continental shelf, sorry, of the coastal state. And that establishes that initial jurisdiction. So the crime or suspected crime has to have taken place in an area where the coastal state does in fact have jurisdiction. The right of hot pursuit may be exercised by military, government or state vessels and aircraft. So it does not just belong to vessels. It's not only warships, patrol vessels, customs vessels, or coast guard vessels that can exercise hot pursuit, but also aircraft and helicopters belonging to that organization. Before hot pursuit may start, the enforcement vessel or aircraft must have given adequate warning. So it has to have given adequate visual and auditory, so sound signals, to the suspect vessel to stop. So it has to have provided, for instance, warnings on radio, on loud hailer, hoisted signal flags indicating to the vessel that it should stop, perhaps made use of flares or warning shots if that is appropriate in the circumstances. But you cannot begin hot pursuit until you have indicated to the suspect vessel that it should stop. If that indication or those instructions are ignored, at that point in time, the hot pursuit may begin. The pursuit must be continuous. And that means that at all times, the suspect vessel must be under the observation of either a military, government or state vessel or aircraft. Not necessarily the same one all the time. The pursuit can be handed over from an aircraft to a ship, from one ship to another ship, from the ships of one country to the ships of another country. 
but there must be this formal handing over procedure and at no time must the pursued vessel be lost from sight. Sight either visual sight or electronic sight, that is radar or other tracking systems. So the pursuit must be continuous. If the suspect vessel manages for a period of time to evade surveillance, then at that time, the hot pursuit has to end. Hot pursuit may continue, as we said, onto the high seas, but it has to stop once the suspect vessel reaches the territorial seas of another state. So if it manages to enter the territorial seas of another state, at that point in time, the hot pursuit must end because the territorial jurisdiction of the coastal state now becomes the most important jurisdictional basis and hot pursuit has to take second place and stop. This is the victim of both of the crimes which we're going to look at today. This rather ugly looking fish, I have to say it's not the best looking fish in the world, is the Patagonian toothfish. And it is known for the quality of its meat and uh, it's considered to be a luxury item. Because uh, the name Patagonian toothfish is perhaps not so attractive to consumers, it has actually been marketed for many years under the name Chilean sea bass. Uh, although that is not its scientific name, that's a marketing name. At one point, the stocks of this particular fish almost completely collapsed. It had been so heavily overfished that the numbers were going down at a massive rate, and it was feared that at some point this fish could actually become extinct. Uh, it is now a very closely managed species in stock, and there are a lot of restrictions and controls on who may actually catch them and how much may be caught even by authorized fishers. So it's a very valuable stock in terms of its financial value. Uh, and therefore, it is an attractive target for illegal activities. And that's what happened in both of the case studies which we're going to see today. Let's begin with the case of the South Tormi. Uh, this case happened in March of 2001, March, April of 2001. And the enforcement vessel involved was actually a civilian vessel called the MV Southern Supporter. This vessel, which is a typical offshore survey and research vessel, was actually under charter by the Australian government because they did not have sufficient vessels to manage their complete EEZ, they had chartered civilian vessels who were working on their behalf. In fact, this case, it was this converted survey and research vessel, the Southern Supporter, and it was sent to control and patrol the Australian exclusive economic zone around an island called Heard Island. Heard Island is in the Southern Ocean, uh, very, very far south, very close to Antarctica. It's Australian territory, and it obviously has a significant exclusive economic zone, which contains very valuable fish resources, among them the Patagonian toothfish. During patrol activities on the 29th March, she made contact with the vessel, which was subsequently identified as the South Tormi. Uh, this vessel was registered in Togo and she appeared to be engaged in legal fishing activities. So they could confirm that she had no license to fish within the Australian EEZ, and therefore it, apparent, it appeared that any activities she was engaged in were in fact illegal. On intercepting the South Tormi, the master of the fishing vessel initially agreed that uh, he would follow the Australian enforcement vessel back to the port of Fremantle in Australia. And the reason for this is that Southern Supporter was neither equipped with the appropriate boats or the appropriate personnel to conduct a boarding in location. And in fact, the sea conditions made boardings in that particular location, as you can see, far down in the Southern Ocean, 
relatively risky. So the South Tommy was ordered to follow the Southern supporter back to the port of Fremantle. However, after following for a few hours, the master of the South Tommy then had second thoughts and said, no, I'm going to make a run for it and attempted to flee from the uh, southern supporter towards the west. The southern supporter began pursuing the vessel. And as you can see from this map, uh, unfortunately here it's very hard to appreciate the distances involved, but this was a chase over here, this section of the track, which covered well over 3,000 nautical miles. So we're talking close to 7,000 kilometers and lasted for two weeks. So the South Tommy was heading westwards, potentially towards its flag state of Togo, and the Southern supporter was continuing to pursue it along that track. Now, clearly the Australian government understood that with just the Southern supporter, and so far away from Australia, their chances of conducting enforcement were not very good. So they contacted the South African government because South Africa was the closest coastal state to the route of the fleeing vessel. And they began negotiating the possibility of support from South Africa. And in fact, what happened was that members of the Australian Defence Force, the Australian military, were deployed to South Africa and were embarked aboard two South African Navy vessels, the vessels you can see in the picture here, SAS Galshewe and SAS Protea, so a large research vessel and an offshore patrol vessel. And these vessels were then deployed from South Africa to support the Southern Supporter in interdicting the South Tommy. In fact, they managed to interdict the South Tommy about 300 nautical miles off Cape Town. Because a boarding was possible in that location, the Australian Defence Forces personnel boarded the vessel, arrested the vessel, and she was escorted back to Fremantle in Australia, arriving there on the 5th of May. Now, as I said, the initial interception took place on the 29th of March. As you can see now, about a month and a half almost later, the intercepted vessel finally is returned to Australia. There was a prosecution of the master of the vessel, which resulted in a fine of about 140 Australian, 140,000, excuse me, Australian dollars. Confiscation of the cargo, which was obviously illegally caught Patagonian toothfish, and that cargo alone was worth 1.5 million Australian dollars, and the vessel itself was seized by the Australian state. Her final fate, in fact, was she was sunk as a wreck for divers to explore uh, in September 2004. That picture you can see there is the engine block of the South Tommy, which now lies uh, as an entertainment location for divers. But you can see in this initial case, the distances which we are talking about, the areas in which these operations were happening, they were happening uh, up to five, 6,000 nautical miles away from Australian mainland. And the effort that was required, the coordination that was required with the South African government in order to be able to board the suspect vessel. One would think that after this case, uh, illegal fishing around Heard Island would be uh, deterred to some extent. Unfortunately, apparently that was not the case because just, just over two years later, uh, there was a similar and perhaps even more demanding case. And in August of 2003, the Southern supporter, which was still under charter to the South African government, was again patrolling the waters around Heard Island. Uh, this is the southern winter, uh, and it's the depths of the southern winter in August, and the weather conditions were extremely bad. Um, when I say extremely bad, I mean to a level which many of us who have not operated in the Southern Ocean cannot even imagine operating routinely in these conditions. 
Again, the crew of the Southern Supporter sighted what they thought was a suspect vessel, approached the vessel, and it was identified as the Viarsa 1, which is a fishing vessel, again, without a permit to fish in that particular zone, and that allegedly was registered in Uruguay. The attempts to contact the vessel took a significant amount of time. It took a day for the master of the Viarsa 1 to actually respond to the visual signals and radio calls from the Southern Supporter. Although the vessels were as close as 200 meters away from each other at times, the master of the Viarsa 1 chose to ignore that he was being spoken to. And the reason for that was because he was fully aware that hot pursuit could not start until such warnings had been given. And therefore, if he ignored those warnings, then he felt that there was no legal basis to be pursued. Eventually, he chose to respond to the Southern supporter. And after initial questioning, again, instructions were given to the Viarsa one to follow the Southern supporter to the port of Fremantle for further investigation. Again, the Southern supporter did not have a boarding party or appropriate boats to be able to conduct an on-scene inspection. What actually happened is that the master of the Viarsa One was aware that a very, very bad storm front was approaching from the west and chose to take advantage of it to attempt to escape from the Southern supporter. And I think those pictures, which you can see on the screen right now, give at least some feeling of the weather conditions in which this particular pursuit uh, occurred. Wave heights were estimated at between 12 and 14 meters. You can see, especially in the lower picture, uh, that this is no exaggeration. Uh, and in fact, the weather conditions began to cause extreme damage to both of the vessels during this pursuit. And this pursuit was even longer than the pursuit of the South Tomi. This was a pursuit which lasted three weeks, covered almost 4,000 nautical miles, and as I've already said, was conducted in weather conditions and environmental conditions, such as ice, because they proceeded extremely far south, very close to Antarctica, which actually threatened the safety of both of the vessels concerned. Again, the Australian government understood that this was not a case that they could handle in isolation, and therefore they contacted their international partners. In this case, South Africa was also contacted, as in the earlier case, but so was the United Kingdom, because having passed the African continent, the fleeing vessel was now in the southern Atlantic, and therefore it was felt appropriate that the UK support um, efforts using their fisheries protection based in the Falklands Islands, which are the islands just off the South American mainland, uh, where the UK had a significant fisheries protection vessel based. Both of these countries answered in the positive, and the UK deployed its fisheries protection vessel, Dorada, which is the vessel you can see on the left in this picture. And this is the Viarsa one. The Southern supporter continued with the chase. And from South Africa, two vessels, the icebreaker Agulas and the salvage tug, which is a very large ocean going tug, John Ross, also were involved in the chase of the Viarsa. And they managed to bring her to a stop, uh, but in a position which was 2,000 nautical miles southwest of Cape Town. So you can see that these activities were happening in sea areas which were extremely distant from the coastal states. Again, Australian enforcement personnel had been flown to South Africa, and this time they were deployed upon the supply ship, SAS Drakensberg, which then took them from Cape Town and headed towards the location of the Viarsa, and they actually managed to conduct a boarding on the 3rd of September. So you can see how long this case lasted from the beginning of August 
to a boarding which actually happened at the beginning of September, so one month later. This map here gives a uh, idea of the distances involved. We're talking about a chase which literally covered half of the globe. So this is where the Vyarsa was first spotted. This is where the Vyarsa was ordered by its flag state Uruguay to return to Uruguay. And this is where the actual interception happened. And you can see that it's in the middle of the Southern Atlantic Ocean with the initial chase having begun, begun in the Southern Oceans. So this is massive distances which we are talking about. Unfortunately, the legal process which followed this case was not as successful as in the case of the South Tormi. And in fact, the masters and the officers of the Vyarsa one were acquitted of all charges. And this, despite the fact that 97 tons of toothfish were, being fa were found aboard and the evidence which was given by the enforcement officers. But the jury who was involved in the case decided to return a verdict of not guilty. The impact of this was uh, the fact that the Australian government for a time was facing potential claims for damages from the owner of this particular vessel. Because Article 111 of UNCLOS doesn't just provide states with the right to conduct hot pursuit, it also makes them liable for cases in which such hot pursuit has been exercised without a crime having occurred. And because uh, the persons were acquitted by the courts, the owners of this vessel felt that they could claim damages from the Australian government. Apparently, for various reasons and due to backroom negotiations, at some point, these claim for the claims for damages were dropped. It's not clear whether any out-of-court settlement actually occurred. So these particular cases raise a number of questions for our enforcement efforts today. The first question is, how ready are our internal processes, so the processes within our organization, and our external processes, so those processes in which we liaise with other international partners? How ready are they to support this long-range hot pursuit? Do we already have channels of communications with our partners? Do we already understand the procedures required to make sure that this hot pursuit remains valid? The continuous uh, surveillance of the target, the handing over of the target between tracking vessels? And once the pursuit ends, are we ready to deploy our enforcement teams to exercise our jurisdiction? It's very important to point out that the pursuit side can be conducted by a warship or a state vessel from any state. But the boarding, the enforcement side, must be conducted by enforcement officers from the state whose laws were broken. So in the case of the two case studies, any boarding had to take place with Australian personnel. And that is why in each case, Australian personnel were deployed to South Africa and then ferried out to the location by South African assets. But if we had to do that in our circumstances, do we have the means, the organization, the procedures to deploy our enforcement personnel to a remote location to be able to conduct this boarding? The other questions we need to ask is, what sort of operational risk are we engaging with? There is the operational risk of having to operate extremely far from home bases. In the case of the Viarsa, had the pursuit lasted for one extra day, then the southern supporter would have not had sufficient fuel to get back to Cape Town. They would have run out of fuel before being able to arrive in a safe port. So that's a significant operational risk. There's an operational risk because we are operating our vessels in areas which potentially may be very dangerous to them because of the weather conditions and also with which they are completely unfamiliar. 
and therefore may not understand what type of uh, navigational hazards and other environmental hazards they may face. So we have to look at how we're going to manage these risks. And we also have to decide when does this risk become too much? When do we say, okay, it's time to stop now. We've made our point pursuing this vessel 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 nautical miles. But now we are risking our personnel. We are risking our assets. And the return on this risk is going to be very low. And from a legal perspective, at some point, if our pursuit is successful, we're going to have to bring these people back to our state and conduct a legal process in our domestic courts. So do our domestic courts recognize hot pursuit as a jurisdictional basis? The fact that hot pursuit is included in UNCLOS, in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, doesn't mean that our domestic courts will necessarily recognize it. So we have to understand, is this going to be accepted by our courts as a potential legal basis? Or are they going to throw out the case and say, you had no jurisdiction to conduct this boarding? Perhaps you should let these people free and not conduct such wild and risky actions on the high seas. It's happened in the past in various domestic courts, and it will happen again in the future. And we need to think about whether this is going to happen to us if we engage in this particular exercise of jurisdiction. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, I'm going to open the floor for any comments, remarks, questions. As I said, please feel free to either raise your hand in the reactions button or make a comment in the chat, or you can just uh, unmute your microphone and go ahead and make your remarks or ask your questions and open discussion with the rest of the participants. So please, the floor is open. Olivier, I see you've appeared. Hello. Good morning. Hey, nice to see you again, Andrew. Hello, hello everybody. Um, maybe I missed uh, one detail, but I didn't catch the reason why the case was dismissed in the uh, tell, tell us. Uh, the reason the case was dismissed is uh, perhaps the major reason why cases are dismissed. They had very good lawyers uh, and the lawyers managed to uh, inject sufficient doubt that they were actually engaged in fishing. And as many of you know, uh, certain legal systems require that an offense is proven beyond reasonable doubt. And the jury received instructions that there was still an element of reasonable doubt that they were engaged in illegal fishing because they were actually never seen fishing but they were seen in the restricted area and they were found with a cargo of protected fish, but it could not be proven beyond reasonable doubt how those fish got on board the vessel. Perhaps they jumped on board the vessel. Perhaps they were transferred from another ship. And this is the type of doubt that good and expensive defense lawyers will try and inject into the legal process. Um, in order to get their clients uh, off the hook. So that's unfortunately what happened in this case. I have a very interesting question from uh, Benji regarding the proper handing over between vessels and aircraft or between vessels from different states during the pursuit. And this is not defined in the law. UNCLOS doesn't describe what this proper handing over is. So this has actually come from practice now. When one vessel is handing over the pursuit to another vessel or aircraft, obviously each of those units needs to make a formal uh, record of the fact that they are handing over or taking over the pursuit of the vessel. So in the logbook of the aircraft or the logbook of the vessel. 
If possible, the radar picture, the voice communications of this handing over procedure should be recorded if that's possible or at least still pictures of a radar screen taken, perhaps with a mobile phone. So every piece of evidence that can be recorded to show that this handing over is happening in a formalized, in a safe and efficient manner should be captured. And that needs to then be presented in the court to show that the vessel I was tracking on enforcement vessel A is the same suspect vessel which was then tracked by enforcement vessel B or aircraft B and so on and so forth. The best is obviously a visual handing over and that means that both the enforcement vessels come close to the suspect vessel. They take photos of each other with the suspect vessel showing in the photo as well to show that they formally handed over this pursuit between each other. So there's no legally defined manner in which the handing over should take place, but any evidence that you can gather um, to show that it has taken place in an appropriate manner should be gathered. So I hope that answers your query. I'm seeing Olivier has raised his hand. Olivier, please. Yes, uh, I think it's the right time to advertise our uh, our uh, Premio Develop Tools, uh, IRIS. Thank you, Benjamin Buru, for your question. <coughs> Indeed, uh, IRIS, the, the, the web-based uh, uh, coordination uh, application uh, from, from Crimayo, uh, does exactly uh, address this need for uh, a place where all uh, legal actions can be recorded uh, in, a, in, a, in a central place. And uh, this, uh, this place can record uh, Actions from various countries, from various assets. So, uh, just just to mention one, just to mention that another another remark is um, the uh, the necessity uh, when you <coughs> when you uh, uh, sorry when you take uh, Article One 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 into domestic law is to have a close watch to the rights of the people detained because so far from cost. The access to a lawyer will be difficult. The access to a doctor will be difficult, and it has to be very, very uh, um, clearly defined in the domestic law how these rights are going to be uh, uh, to be um, developed. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Olivier. Um, I have two questions. I have one from Nelson who has his hands up, and another one from Heiko, which is in the chat. I'll start with Nelson because he was first, and then I'll come to your query, Heiko. Good morning, Nelson. Please go ahead. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez, s'il vous plaît? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, Permettez-moi de m'exprimer en français. Uh, je suis au CRCO, uh, au Seychelles. Alors, ma question uh, se pose sur la valeur juridique uh, des outils uh, de surveillance, des plateformes de surveillance que nous avons uh, dans la plupart des centres. Alors, je fais référence plus particulièrement à une plateforme que nous appelons Skylight. C'est une plateforme dédiée exclusivement à la pêche INN. Alors, cette plateforme peut montrer des navires qui font du transbordement à mer. Alors, euh, ils tracent euh, les deux bateaux euh, pendant, leur, euh, pendant leur trajet. Donc, on peut, on peut voir que les deux bateaux sont côte à côte pendant un certain nombre de temps, euh, qui nous amène à conclure à un transbordement. Bon, évidemment, il euh, n'y a pas de fragment de lit parce qu'il faudrait un budget. Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. Euh, allô? Nelson, uh, did you hear the comments from the interpreter? He would like you to speak a little bit more slowly and more clearly, if possible. Nelson? Et là, vous m'entendez, s'il vous plaît? Oui, là, c'est mieux. Continuez comme ça, on vous entend bien. Uh, okay, je disais que... Um, 
par rapport à l'intervention de, de l'exposant que nous remercions, euh, je pose la, la question de la valeur juridique euh, des plateformes que nous utilisons dans les différents centres. Je parle des plateformes de surveillance. Alors, euh, je voudrais faire allusion plus particulièrement à une plateforme que nous appelons Skylight, euh, qui est dédiée euh, exclusivement à la PCNN. Alors, euh, cette plateforme peut tracer euh, deux bateaux euh, qui sont en train de faire du transbordement. Alors, transbordement parce que euh, nous pouvons voir que les deux bateaux se suivent ce pôle pendant un certain temps, qui peut être deux heures, trois heures, quatre heures, et nous en disons forcément que c'est un transbordement. Alors, nous n'avons pas, bien entendu, la preuve formelle qu'il y a eu transbordement, sauf s'il y a un survol d'un aéronef qui peut prendre des photos et confirmer. Mais l'expérience nous a montré que c'est assez fiable parce que quand nous interrogeons les bateaux une fois qu'ils sont en quai, ils confirment effectivement que c'est du transbordement soit, soit c'est du transport des appâts, euh, soit c'est des transbordements autorisés euh, après investigation. Alors, ma question maintenant, euh, je reviens encore là-dessus, sur la valeur juridique de ces preuves. On peut amener ces éléments dans les tribunaux, euh, mais est-ce qu'ils sont recevables? Merci. Uh, before I answer that question, I would like to just ask an additional question. Are the transshipments happening within an exclusive economic zone or are they happening on the high seas? Alors, um, uh, il peut y avoir de, dans les deux possibilités. Il, il, il y a les deux possibilités, mais toutefois, bien entendu, comprenez que uh, dans la zone où nous nous trouvons, euh, nous avons euh, la commission tonnier de l'océan indien euh, qui euh, donne certaines autorisations aux bateaux de mener des activités à mer. Donc, euh, nous nous référons toujours à cette commission de l'océan indien pour savoir si euh, les bateaux impliqués ont toutes les autorisations nécessaires. Sinon, euh, dans les deux cas, on, on peut avoir ce type de transbordement. Merci. Okay, thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Nelson, understood. So, um, first of all, when it comes to hot pursuit, this is a national jurisdiction. So the crime or suspected crime must have occurred somewhere in your national jurisdictional zones, like, for instance, the exclusive economic zone. So it does not apply to regional agreements, for instance, agreements under the IOC or other agreements which permit boardings on the high seas thanks to regional agreement. Uh, hot pursuit is an exercise of purely national jurisdiction. The second point is the quality of the evidence. And you referred to transshipment or ship-to-ship -ship operations which are observed perhaps not directly but are a pattern which from experience you know is associated with the illegal or unregulated transshipment of fish and the problem there is not a problem of international law the problem there is going to be in your domestic court. Will your domestic court accept the evidence which you are going to present to it as sufficient? Because if it doesn't, then Article 111 also provides for liability in paragraph 8. So if you conduct this type of action under hot pursuit, and subsequently the persons who you pursued were found to be not guilty and not have committed any sort of contravention or crime, then you are exposing your government to liability and significant liability. Uh, because if pursuits extend over a number of days, if they disrupt legitimate fishing activities, if you seize and arrest a vessel for an extended period of time and its crew, 
all of these will have legal claims against you. So um, it's very, very important that you are comfortable with the evidence that you have, that it will stand up in your domestic courts. Some courts may accept electronic surveillance evidence as 100% evidence and absolutely okay. Other courts may require more evidence, a higher threshold of evidence in order to prove a case. So that's then down to your individual domestic courts and your experience as to what type of evidence they will accept. So I hope that that's addressed your question. Uh, and this is a general issue of presenting cases in court. What are the levels and quality of evidence that different courts may or may not accept? I'll now move to um, two questions I have in the chat. The first one was from Heiko, and he's asking, how can a entity which potentially is not internationally recognized exercise hot pursuit? And the answer is actually very similar to the answer I gave to Nelson. Uh, the pursuit is going to be adjudged in a domestic court. So if the domestic court, which is going to prosecute the persons, is happy to uh, accept that this pursuit was conducted on a sound legal basis, then the uh, nature of the entity conducting that hot pursuit, the specific character in international legal law, international law is perhaps less relevant. I would point out, however, that it can also be challenged in an international court. And therefore, you have to be careful that whatever activities you are conducting on the high seas stand up to scrutiny both in the domestic courts of the entity who is conducting that hot pursuit, but potentially also in international courts. We've seen the concept of jurisdiction in the EEZ be challenged many times in the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. So what may the coastal state actually regulate in the EEZ? For instance, bunkering operations. So you're going to be subject to two levels of legal challenge. The challenge of the domestic courts, where you are going to actually bring the case for its initial trial, but also potentially a challenge in the international courts if the injured parties feel that an exercise of jurisdiction was conducted where it should not have been conducted. So it's a difficult situation which is going to have to be navigated in a manner that exposes you to the least possible legal risk um, that you can find. So I would, uh, I would therefore sound a note of caution in that particular case, and perhaps you may have to uh, revisit the legal basis on which such a pursuit occurs. So um, I also have in the chat another question. I also have Ellie who has his hand up. I'll go to the chat question first because it was there first. And it's the question of, listen, what channels can we use to transfer data or um, hand over um, the data, the tracking data from one unit to another? And uh, there's two platforms which have been mentioned here, IORIS and C-Vision. And the answer is, it doesn't matter which platform you're going to use. Uh, as long as there is this clear handing over of tracking data, this clear handing over of the pursuit, and it's done in a manner which you are going to be able to present to a court and demonstrate that this handing over took place in a controlled, appropriate, and logged, recorded manner. So it's platform agnostic. So it doesn't really matter which platform you use. If all you have is a logbook and a camera, then you're going to be taking notes in a logbook made of paper and using a pen, which is something we're not very used to nowadays. Now everything is electronic. And taking a few pictures with your mobile phone. 
Now, as for the interoperability of the platforms, I'm not the best person to be asking. Potentially, Olivier can intervene here because he is far more of an expert on IORIS than I am. Olivier, I'm going to hand this one over to you before I then turn to Ellie and his question. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, IORIS and, and, uh, and Subvision are both um, web-based platforms. So the risk is uh, if you lose uh, your internet connectivity, you will lose both platforms. But okay, let me ask the, the, the question like it is. Uh, like it is. Uh, if you if you cannot use uh, Yoris any longer, uh, can you transfer migrate uh, data to Civision? Uh, today the answer is no. Uh, indeed, um, uh, Civision is a is a provider of Yoris and not and not the not the other way around. So it is possible to transfer data from Civision to Yoris, but today it is not possible to transfer. Uh, data from Yoris to Civision, except using, uh, of course, the uh, the, oper the operating systems tools like copy and paste, and also uh, in in Iris you can um, make a PDF of the uh, of the operation logbook. So this PDF can be reinjected in as a PDF in uh, as a document in uh, in Civision. So this is the, the strict uh, technical answer. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Olivier, for, for dealing with that issue. I hope that uh, we've addressed both the questions of Heiko and uh, Jacek. Let me now move to Eli. He has his hand up. Eli, please, the floor is yours. So, radio check? Yes, we can hear you slightly low, but clear. Good. So I have two questions, please. Uh, the first one is, in the article 111 in the UNCLOS, uh, it, it's mentioned that where a ship has been stopped or arrested outside the TTW in circumstances which do not justify the exercise of the right of hot pursuit, it shall be compensated and so on. Uh, is a non-cooperative behavior of a vessel um, an evidence uh, enough to uh, go on with the hot pursuit if the ship itself is non-cooperative, is not answering the calls, and is uh, not um, on the VHF channels that it has to be on. Okay, do you want to ask, ask the second question as well, and then I answer them both? Yeah, so the second question is, um, a hot pursuit with a fishing vessel is actually not so complicated. But what happens if we are on a hot pursuit to a boat overloaded with illegal immigrants and where the safety at sea is like the very first priority and we have kids, women, and we are in big numbers on board. So the main question right here is that the boat, if it reaches another EEZ than the initial one where the crime started, uh, can the boarding party of the second country take over because actually the boat uh, violated uh, both countries' uh, rules and international laws. So uh, is it possible that we say not the country doing hot pursuit, but the second country where the boat arrived uh, does the boarding uh, mission? Thank you. Uh, two excellent questions. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll first um, start with the, the issue of a non-cooperative vessel and whether that non-cooperative attitude is sufficient to initiate hot pursuit. And again, this comes down to evidence. Um, I, I'll speak from my personal experience without wishing to, to insult any section of the maritime industry, but generally fishermen were very non-cooperative. Um, they were busy, they were making their livelihood at sea, the last thing that they wanted to see was a patrol vessel uh, with a boarding team who was, you know, interrupting their, their commercial activity. And they would spend hours uh, ignoring us and making sure that they were not on the relevant radio channels to speak with us. Um, and at the end of the day, we would actually have to physically send a boarding party to establish that communication. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're breaking the law. So again, it's an operational risk management decision. 
how much evidence do I have that something illegal is happening? If, for instance, they are refusing to talk to me, and at the same time they are pulling a net out of the water, which I can see is full of fish, and they are conducting this activity in an area where they have no license to conduct it, then now I have further visual evidence that a crime is occurring. And therefore, this is, this is very much a question of looking at all the circumstances of the event and deciding whether I have sufficient evidence to engage in my enforcement activity. Because as you pointed out, uh, if I engage in enforcement activity against a vessel which has not committed a crime, I'm actually uh, subject to potentially being uh, found liable for damages, for losses and damages. The second question uh, in respect of uh, boats carrying irregular or illegal migrants. First of all, I'd like to point out that hot pursuit ends not at the EEZ of another country, but at the territorial seas, regardless of what type of crime. Even if it was a fishing crime, the hot pursuit ends at the territorial seas of the second country. And hot pursuit, just like any other exercise of jurisdiction, has to be conducted with due regard for safety of life. Uh, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea has found that any form of excessive force used in enforcement actions is actually a crime by the coastal state. And when you're dealing with an overloaded uh, migrant vessel, clearly you have to act in a manner uh, which has due regard for the safety of the persons on board that particular vessel. So you cannot use excessive force. You cannot conduct dangerous maneuvers that may cause that vessel to capsize clearly. So yes, you have to have that due regard. And once that vessel has arrived at the territorial seas of another coastal state, then that coastal state may decide to either exercise or not exercise uh, their enforcement jurisdiction over that particular case. Um, speaking from personal experience here in the Mediterranean, when we were conducting hot pursuit of fishing vessels, Italian fishing vessels, and these would try and flee back to Italian waters, we would be very happy to allow them to get back into the territorial seas of Italy, because the Italian government would punish them even more for fishing illegally somewhere in a third party state than we would punish them. The fines, the financial burdens which would be imposed on them by the Italian government were actually higher than the ones that we could impose on them under our law. So we would continue the pursuit up to Italian territorial seas. We would inform our Italian Coast Guard colleagues of what was happening. They would be waiting for them at the 12 nautical mile limit of the Italian territorial seas. The fisherman would think that he has escaped um, our pursuit and escaped our jurisdiction, which was in fact the case. But then he would be subjected to the Italian jurisdiction, which was actually worse for him or her than would have been our jurisdiction. So as long as there is good international cooperation, even that movement into the territorial seas of a third party doesn't necessarily mean that the person has escaped any potential uh, penalty or sanction for the illegal act that they may have um, committed. So I hope that addresses your questions. Heiko, I can see that you have your hand up, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, good. Uh, I hope you can understand me and uh, communication as well. I have a practical things, a practical question about my own case, what has happened in 2014 in the uh, Mediterranean Sea. I was a master on a ship and we German ship, German flag, and we drop anchor in the southern bank. That was the only possibility to drop anchor due to the depths of the sea in the Mediterranean Sea because uh, Spain don't allow us without any any reason to drop anchor in their coastal area or in the territorial waters. So we choose the southern bank, what is outside territorial waters in, uh, in Morocco. Uh, but it was in the EEZ of uh, Morocco, and they said we destroyed. So even in the in the sea chart was was uh, uh, 
no any restriction to drop anchor to make anything. This was even no fishing ground, but they use mostly the sound bank for, for, for fishing. So, and the Marox comes to us uh, and not only to us, even to the tankers and whatever, and force us to leave uh, their uh, EEZ because we damaged the, the fishing grounds uh, by our anchors and blah, blah, blah. So finally, uh, to avoid any problems, <laughs> I moved, uh, but some tankers, uh, they're still there and it is uh, 100 meter depth there, but it was even deep sea anchorage. But uh, my question was now, because they even said we will make our law enforcement Morocco and we send our boarding teams and we will even uh, um, yeah, bring your vessel to our port for further investigation and and and. So uh, I follow the, the orders, but some other captains say we are in international waters and we not make any illegal things. So my question is if it was a, when they're coming on board, it will be an unlawful act by a government. Okay, um, I'll, I, I would hesitate always to describe any act as unlawful immediately without knowing the details of the case. Um, as the coastal state, there is a right to protect um, fisheries within that uh, exclusive economic zone. Um, and some governments have established protected areas within their exclusive economic zone where, for instance, activities such as anchoring are not permitted to avoid damage to particular environmental features or particular species which are sedentary species which live on the bottom of the sea. Um, obviously, these regulations have to be notified to the wider international community. In some cases, coastal states fail to do that or fail to do that effectively. So I can't comment on whether in this particular case such regulations either existed or if they existed, whether they had been adequately notified. So potentially, yes, the coastal state can uh, impose such restrictions within the exclusive economic zone as long as they fall within the exclusive economic zone rights as defined uh, within the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is uh, part five of the UN Convention. So, um, you know, the protection and preservation of the marine environment is one of the rights which is accorded to states in Article 56. How that's interpreted uh, is a little bit of a question mark, and I've said that there have been a number of cases already in the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, which make very interesting reading. Uh, so what is definitely required from the coastal state is that they publicize these regulations in a manner that the international shipping community can be aware of what is happening and why they may or may not conduct such activities in that area. So potentially jurisdiction was there, um, potentially jurisdiction was not there. Uh, it's a case where you'd have to examine the legal framework established by the coastal state in some more detail. And that legal framework should be made available to the general shipping public so they understand it. So I hope that addressed your particular query. I see that Nelson has raised his hand again. Please, Nelson, go ahead. Make sure you speak very slowly and clearly for the interpreter so that we can all understand your question. Thank you. Uh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Loud, uh, uh, loud and clear. Uh, merci encore une fois de me donner la parole. C'est Moussoun au CERCEO. Alors, ma question, je voudrais partager avec vous uh, un, un cas que nous avons uh, vécu au, au CERCEO. Alors, uh, on, uh, le gouvernement Seychellois avait reçu une note verbale uh, venant de la Philippine, du gouvernement philippin. Euh, qui demandait son intervention sur un bateau de pêche qui se trouvait euh, euh, au large euh, des côtes euh, sachelois pour intervenir euh, parce que les marins euh, seraient euh, soumis à un état d'esclavagisme par euh, un bateau euh, chinois. Alors, euh, la Philippine a voulu que nous intervenions à bord 
pour faire un, un abordage. Alors, la question on nous a été soumise au niveau du centre régional, mais on n'a pas eu de, de réponse à donner, tout simplement parce que on n'avait pas vraiment de preuves pour pouvoir monter à bord. Donc, du coup, ça a été très difficile à traiter ce cas. Donc, je voudrais euh, votre avis sur cette question. Est-ce qu'on on peut, peut monter à bord sur la simple euh, présomption euh, des traitements euh, des êtres humains à bord? Donc, ça a été un peu compliqué pour nous de, de, de pouvoir intervenir. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous éclairer sur euh, ce genre de cas, s'il vous plaît? Sure, thank you for the question, Nelson. Um, the, the first question which I will have in return is where this vessel was. So if this vessel was within the territorial seas of the Seychelles, then the simple answer would be yes. You have absolute jurisdiction over such vessels uh, unless they are state vessels which enjoy state immunity like warships or, or, or Coast Guard vessels. Um, but if you had suspicion that persons on board were being held against their will, uh, and this vessel was within your territorial seas, um, clearly you would have had jurisdiction to board the vessel and conduct any further inspection required to verify whether um, such a crime was taking place. Uh, if the vessel was not within your territorial seas, it becomes more difficult. Or you also have, in the case of Seychelles, your archipelagic waters, because the Seychelles is an archipelagic state. So again, if it was within the archipelagic waters, I would argue that, yes, you had um, the jurisdiction to intervene. Outside territorial seas or archipelagic waters, it becomes more difficult. Um, slavery is mentioned within UNCLOS in Article 99, but it places the burden on the flag states to make sure that vessels flying their flag do not uh, engage in the exploitation or transportation of slaves. So in this case, uh, although the Philippines was an interested party in that the individuals concerned were Philippines, um, citizens, um, you may not have the jurisdiction because Philippines are not the flag state and therefore cannot grant that jurisdiction. So in this case, it's a question of where the vessel is within the territorial seas or potentially archipelagic waters. The jurisdiction is relatively clear for you to investigate any claims that persons are being held against their will and exploited in what is a de facto case of slavery. Outside, then it comes very much down to the flag state. I think if I heard correctly, the flag state here was China, and therefore it would require the Philippines or the Seychelles to engage with that flag state, express their concerns, and ask for flag state permission to conduct this uh, boarding. So uh, a relatively complicated case, I agree. And it all comes down to where the vessel was at the time that the request was made. I, I hope that addresses um, the, the question which came from RCOC. Okay, I'm not sure uh, if there is... moi de, de réagir, s'il vous plaît. Sure, sure, please, go ahead. Alors, alors évidemment, le bateau s'est retrouvé, trouvé dans les eaux internationales, euh, raison pour laquelle on avait eu tout le mal à intervenir. Alors, deuxièmement, euh, bah, c'est une question un peu bizarre. Et si on poussait le bateau euh, d'une manière ou d'une autre à rentrer dans, dans les ZEE de sécher et puis de pouvoir euh, intervenir après, est-ce possible? So regarding your first point, the fact that it happened on the high seas, then, then clearly, um, unfortunately, in this case, you would have had no direct jurisdiction. As for the second point, if you used 
force or any kind of um, um, forceful persuasion to make that vessel enter your territorial seas, then you would not have had jurisdiction even after the vessel was in your territorial seas, because that jurisdiction would have been established illegally. The reality is that in this case on the high seas, uh, the flag state has exclusive jurisdiction with a few minor exceptions. And those minor exceptions are piracy uh, and illegal transmission, radio transmissions, if your coastal state was affected. Slavery, unfortunately, as it is currently written in UNCLOS, is not sufficient basis to conduct this type of boarding on the high seas. Um, and the burden is on the flag state to make sure that it is not happening. So at that point in time, it would have meant that engagement with the flag state would have been really critical uh, to see whether they would be ready to allow either the Philippines or the Seychelles to conduct this boarding to verify the welfare of these individuals on board and whether these individuals were actually being uh, exploited. I will point out that the masters of the vessels conducting such activities, so exploiting individuals uh, in what is de facto slavery, they are very, very aware of uh, the legal framework. And they know that if they stay on the high seas, that they are relatively untouchable except by the flag state. So they, they act in a manner which makes it as difficult as possible to conduct such enforcement actions. So I hope that that has addressed um, your questions. Okay, I'm not hearing any follow up. So I will assume that that has addressed the points which were raised. And I can see that Heiko has raised his hand. Please, sir, go ahead. Yes, uh, again, I have another uh, practical question uh, that's coming from uh, uh, probably two, but uh, let us make one only. First, um, what has happened when you have a hot pursuit from a country what is not recognized UNCLOS, or even the flag state is not recognized uh, UNCLOS, uh, or signing, sorry, as a rectify uh, a ratification and signing the, the international, um, how we say, the international uh, law? Thank you. That's actually a very easy one. Um, there, are there are countries who have not uh, signed the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea or who have not ratified it through their parliament. But because so many countries have ratified, signed, acceded to UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, it is widely accepted that it is now customary law. And customary law means that it is law that applies to all states, regardless of whether they have chosen to ratify it or not. So no state can argue that it is not a party to UNCLOS and therefore not liable to the obligations under UNCLOS. And equally so, no state can argue that it may not exercise the privileges which UNCLOS gives to coastal states. A clear example would be the US. For various reasons, the US has not yet ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And the reasons are internal political reasons rather than any violent disagreement with what is in the convention. But every day, U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Navy exercise the rights which are within the convention. And many people think this is a very hypocritical approach. But the reality is that UNCLOS now applies to every state because it has become recognized as customary international law and therefore applying to all states regardless of whether they have signed on the dotted line or not. So that's actually a relatively straightforward issue to discuss. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 
thank you thank you yeah uh, yeah can i can i send uh, uh, ask a second question maybe it's uh, possible you will not pay extra to us ask a second uh, question so okay. go ahead okay. yes okay uh, i was working last year in rome in the um, in the headquarter of the european mission irini um as uh, maritime senior advisor um and there was a situation like this that we found uh, <laughs> from the Libyan coast, um, uh, this no-go zone that was uh, published and issued 2016 uh, over the normal national channel. You, maybe you know the cases. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, very often it was happened 27 cases that merchant ships was doing this innocent passage outside territorial waters stopped by Libyan, I say, uh, Coast Guard, but it was not official Coast Guard, I don't know. So, but um, that was stopped and for investigation and they said, you're passing the no-go zone, what we published, but it was, uh, yeah, long time ago and not uh, renewed. And um, therefore the, the vessel was stopped and must pay penalty between 10,000 and 150,000 dollars. So, and uh, for our side was it the unlawful act, but the problem is this was not official Coast Guard. And uh, so how is the uh, legal situation about this vessels even, uh, can they, for example, a, a flag state protest against this action from this Libyan Coast Guard uh, due to this, um, this, uh, this was an um, innocent passage stoppage, I would say like this one, maybe you understood what I'm meaning. Thank you. Yeah, um, this comes down to the same provisions that there are in UNCLOS on hot pursuit. Any action conducted by a government or a government agency which is not in line with the convention may expose that government to legal um, jeopardy and legal liability. So if a government establishes a maritime zone of jurisdiction which is not in line with the convention and attempts to enforce it, those enforcement actions can be challenged subsequently in a court. The reality is also that those enforcement actions are generally challenged at sea. I don't want to mention particular countries, but I'm sure you're all aware of particular claims in uh, uh, the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean by certain states which are debated by other states, well, one of the most efficient ways of debating them is to take one of your Coast Guard vessels or one of your Navy vessels and exercise what you perceive to be your freedom of navigation. They're called freedom of navigation operations. And these are regularly conducted by certain navies um, to make a legal point that they do not recognize such illegal claims and that such illegal claims will not be tolerated and may not be exercised. So, yes, there are still states who claim jurisdiction at sea, which perhaps is not completely in line with UNCLOS. <clears throat> and there have been rulings by various international tribunals and courts on such claims. And um, any penalties which have been awarded on the basis of these claims are in fact illegal penalties and may be challenged by flag states. Flag states also challenge them, as I said, by taking their warships, their Coast Guard vessels and showing presence in these, in these debated areas in what they call freedom of navigation operations. So this still happens. Um, and it's something which we will have to deal with as we go forward in managing the maritime domain. I'm not sure if there are any other questions or remarks. Uh, if there aren't, I will hand over the floor to Olivier for some closing remarks. Olivier, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much to all for this, uh, this very uh, interesting uh, session. Uh, thank you very much to Isabel for having uh, set up uh, all this um, uh, session today. Um, by the way, uh, tell me, uh, Andrew, when is the next one? You're mute. You've asked me an extremely difficult question. I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head. Uh, I know I have a right. program somewhere, but I don't know exactly when the next one is. Okay, it is not in it is not in uh, in August uh, anyway. No, it's so, not in August. Yeah, August will be free. Uh, 
we will have the pleasure to together again in uh, in uh, September, I guess. Um, uh, Isabel is telling us that uh, we will uh, we can have uh, access to the last edition online. It's in the chat. Um, I, I like um, Andrew. I have a, a very last question for you because I was thinking about this uh, these exceptions of uh, you know the the five exception of the. Uh, the uh, the authority of a flag state. Uh, I mean the uh, the exclusive authority of flag state, and slave trade is is one of these uh, exception. So okay, I agree that uh, um, I agree that a fisher a fishing vessel um, uh, taking distance with the labor rules, uh, having uh, some people on board which are not well. It's not slave trade, but uh, do you think we can we can we can extend this uh, this uh, this slave trade exception to to things like that. Uh, the first part of the answer is I would say that yes, it is in fact trading in slaves um, to a certain extent. I would agree that that is the slave trade. The second thing is um, when it comes to the exclusions to flag state jurisdiction, slave trade is mentioned, but it's not that clear in the law. And if you read Article 99 of UNCLOS, there is no blanket provision for the flag state to lose its jurisdiction. What is required is it shall take effective measures. And some people argue that if it fails to take effective measures, then it loses its exclusive jurisdiction. But that isn't so um, specific in the law. So... Uh, the slave trade is a bit of a debate, and you could quite easily violate flag state jurisdiction by just acting too hastily. It's always a good idea in the case of slave trade or suspicion of the trade in slaves to engage with the flag state and have them also be on board with what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. This is, this is now clear in my mind. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, let us uh, reconvene in, uh, in September for the next uh, edition. And uh, well, enjoy, enjoy August if you have leave and, uh, and uh, be courageous. Oh, by the way, uh, Isabel, maybe you want to take a picture, do you? Isabel definitely wants to take a picture and I was about she, to come to that and she, I was going to will. ask as many of possible uh, as possible of you to switch on your cameras briefly if you're comfortable with that and that will allow uh, Isabel to take a nice uh, screenshot uh, which will then be potentially published on our website. Uh, is Isabel still online? Yes. Yes, I'm there here. she is. Okay, I thought we had lost you Isabel for a moment. I was panicking. <laughs> no, no, no. So all yours, Isabel. Uh, so I'm um, waiting a little bit, but because not everybody has has switched off, has switched on the camera, but uh, so it's, yes, I see the SCOC online uh, and other people I know, <laughs> of course. Uh, so just one smile. And another one. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And Isabel. you will receive in the coming days the the full recording, the PowerPoint, and the summary made by Andrew. Yeah, so okay, as mentioned great. by Isabel, we'll be sending you all the materials related to this webinar. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much for your interventions. Um, the questions which were asked were interesting. They were engaging, sometimes difficult, which is how they should be, because otherwise we're not learning anything and we're not engaging with interesting subjects. I look forward to having you uh, join me relatively soon again for another one of these webinars. And I wish you a pleasant uh, holiday season for those of you who are going to manage to take some leave over the month of August. Uh, I will be joining my colleagues from Mauritius uh, over next week. I'll be there on work as well for a different project. So I hope your weather is good and that I will enjoy your wonderful island for uh, four or five days um, in the Indian Ocean. In the meantime, thank you to everybody. Wish you uh, a safe and productive week and look forward to having you join us again for Tuesday Second Chance.
Take care. Thank you, Andrew. Very interesting. Thank you. Bye, thank you.